Did you know that glaciers can move at the astonishing rate of 100 meters or 300 feet in a single day? A glacier is a large mass of ice. It forms on land and it moves downhill under the influence of gravity. Now there are many different types of glaciers, but the three main ones are continental glaciers, also called ice sheets, ice caps, and valley glaciers. Now continental glaciers, they are, as the name suggests, extremely large geographical sheets of ice greater than about 50,000 square kilometers. Now the ice sheets that cover Greenland and Antarctica are the only two continental glaciers left in the world today. Ice caps are similar to continental glaciers, except that they are typically found in mountainous areas and are smaller than continental glaciers, so less than about 50,000 square kilometers in size. Valley glaciers, once again, as the name suggests, are glaciers that are restricted to valleys. Now typically, okay, but not always, valley glaciers will connect with mountainous ice caps. Glaciers, well, they form in both polar and temperate regions and will begin to accumulate when more snow falls during the colder times of the year than melts during the warmer times of the year. Now, of course, most glacial ice is going to be found at the Earth's poles where not much ice sort of melts during the warmer times of the year. Okay, here's a fun fact. Did you know that 85% of glacial ice is found in Antarctica. And that means that Antarctica is storing most of the Earth's supplies of fresh water. All right, coming right back to it. In order to become a glacier, the snow that accumulates in the zone of accumulation must be compressed first into granules, then into a more compact form of snow called fern, before finally turning into highly compacted glacial ice. So as snow falls at the zone of accumulation, it will be buried and compacted. And this process continues until the original fluffy snowflakes eventually get recrystallized into glacial ice, a process that is really, really similar to the way that sediment turns into very dense metamorphic rocks. Now, glaciers move under their own weight and they can advance, they can retreat, or they can remain stationary. And this will only happen when the accumulating snow is in equilibrium with the melting ice. Melting occurs at the zone of ablation, also called the zone of wasting, and as we've already noted, accumulation occurs in the zone of accumulation. The line that separates these two zones is called the equilibrium line, and it moves in response to the overall budget of falling snow to melting ice. The more snow that accumulates, well, the more the line moves downwards. Uh, the more the ice melts, the more the line moves upwards. Now, this is really interesting. The ice locked up within a glacier is actually always flowing downhill, even though the glacier itself can move up or downhill. And I know what you're thinking. Uh, that just doesn't seem to make sense. Essentially, the ice is always flowing, flowing downhill. But in the zone of ablation, the ice wastes away through melting, evaporation, or even breaking off into icebergs if the glacier reaches the ocean. That process is known as carving and has absolutely nothing to do with the birth of cows. So although the glacial ice is always moving downhill, the glacier itself can still retreat uphill if the melting ice outpaces the downhill flow of ice. All right, fun fact number two. Did you know that glaciers can move at the astonishing rate of 100 meters or 300 feet in a single day? That's so much for using glacial movement as a metaphor for slowness. Now, although moving water is the best known agent of erosion, you'd be surprised by just how much erosion a glacier can achieve. In fact, without glacial erosion, we wouldn't have stunning landscapes like this. Consider Yosemite's spectacular half dome peak. The sheer cliff formed when a massive glacier undercut the dome's base. 
Now, although just as a side, and for those of you who like trivia, you should know that Half Dome was most likely never a full dome, and so the name is a little bit misleading. Okay, moving on. Essentially, this smooth, rounded valley next to Half Dome formed when an advancing glacier pulverized its rugged V-shaped precursor. V-shaped valleys are shaped by rivers that cut down into the valley floor, giving it a distinct V-shape. U-shaped valleys form when advancing glaciers, they pulverize the prior V-shaped valley floor into a distinct U-shape. Interestingly, if tributary glacial valleys pass through a main glacial valley, the tributary channel ends in what is known as a hanging valley. Now today, hanging valleys are usually home to spectacular waterfalls like this. Hanging valleys, well they form because the tributary glaciers, they're not as heavy as the main glaciers and so they don't dig out as much material and rock, hence the shallower U-shaped valley. Glaciers have radically changed the topography of many mountainous regions, leaving behind distinctive rugged features such as cirques, horns, and arets. Now cirques, as the name suggests, are semi-circular erosive features that are formed by headward erosional processes at the glacier's head. If several cirques cut the mountain back on all sides, then you end up with a horn. Arets are the sharp ridges that form when two glacial valleys, they excavate the mountain side by side. Now the last set of features that we want to discuss today are those associated with glacial deposition. As heavy glaciers move over solid rock, they are able to pluck away rocks and sediment of all different sizes, from, from class to small as mud, all the way to extremely large rock classes as big as houses. Glaciers can carry large loads of sediment both within them at their surface from falling rock, but mostly from erosion at the glacier's base and from its sides if it is a valley glacier. Now this sediment, it gets deposited when the glacier melts and sort of retreats, leaving behind these linear ridges of unsorted rock and sediment called moraines. Now the rock debris itself, that's the rocks that's inside the moraines, they're given the name till. When moraines form between two parallel glaciers, they are called medial moraines. They are called lateral moraines when they mark the outside edge of a glacier, and they are called end moraines when they mark, well, the end or terminus of a glacier. Other end moraines can also form as the glacier retreats and mark times when the glacier is temporarily stationary. Now, another distinctive feature formed by glaciers are striated pavements. Since the glacier is really, really heavy, the rock fragments that are buried in space can cut down into the bedrock as the glacier moves over the surface, leaving behind very distinctive linear striation. Okay, so let's check your comprehension. Now, don't forget to pause the video right after I ask the questions if you don't want to hear the answers straight away. Okay, so here we go. What kind of a glacier is this? And if you said a continental glacier, then you'd be right. All right, true or false? Glacial ice always flows downhill. And if you said true, then great job. Remember, glaciers can move uphill, but the ice within the glacier is always flowing, and it's flowing downhill. Now, what shaped valleys are diagnostic for glacial erosion? If you said a U-shape, great job. All right, what is this feature called? And a cirque is the answer that you wanted here. What about this feature? The answer is an end moraine. Okay, true or false? Glaciers always move at very, very slow rates. And the answer is false. As it turns out, some glaciers have been known to leap at an amazing 300 feet a day. All right, if you got all of those correct, then give yourself a pat on the back. Okay, so it's time now for our spotlight on creationism. The thickest glaciers on Earth are found on Greenland and Antarctica and can have thicknesses of ice as great as four kilometers or 2.5 miles thick. So how long could it take for that much ice to accumulate? Well, 
central Greenland's four kilometer thick ice cap is said to have taken 100,000 years. Now, if you crunch the numbers, we end up with a rate of about 1.5 inches a year. Empirical observations, however, conclusively show that the rate of ice accumulation, it can proceed at incredibly rapid rates. This is a Lockheed P-38 World War II fighter plane that due to bad weather was forced to make an emergency landing on the Greenland ice cap on the 15th of July, 1942, while the crew were on their way to a mission in Britain. In the squadron, along with the P-38, were five other P-38s and two B-17 bombers that also had to make an emergency landing. Now, all the planes landed safely and the crew were later rescued, but the planes were abandoned and forgotten until in 1992, so 50 years later, this particular P-38 was salvaged. Now here it is, restored and flying in all its former glory. Now what's unusual about this discovery was the depth that the planes lay in the ice. Everyone on the salvage mission supposed that the planes would be either at the surface or buried under just a few meters of ice. But astonishingly, all eight planes were buried in 268 feet of ice. 268 feet. Now in order to extract uh, this particular P-38, special equipment had to be brought in to melt huge holes in the ice. And the salvagers then broke the plane up under the ice and brought it up in pieces. This is a truly remarkable finding because it empirically shows that if the conditions are ripe, ice can accumulate rapidly, apparently at a rate of 5.2 feet a year. Uh, compare that to the 1.5 inches a year proposed for Greenland's central ice cap. Now another fascinating discovery was the number of ice layers that formed between the plains and the surface. There could perhaps be thousands of them here. And this means that at least at this location, each layer of ice was not deposited over a one year period. That's an assumption that is often made for ice layers found elsewhere on Greenland. Now importantly, these data do not necessarily prove that the rate of 1.5 inches per year is false, since other World War II planes have been found at the surface like this B-29 bomber that made an emergency landing in 1947. Notice that it is still at the surface. But, and this is what is important, if the conditions are right, then ice can be deposited at a catastrophic rate. Now given a young age creationist model where after the flood, warm oceans produced abundant precipitation which rapidly turned to snow at the poles due to an atmosphere filled with volcanic aerosols and dust, and four kilometer thick ice caps could have formed in just a few decades or hundreds of years. Okay, so that's all from me, Ken Colson here at Creation Geology for Beginners. Please, if this was interesting in any way whatsoever, then go ahead and share this on your social media platform. I really, really appreciate that. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and of course, if you'd like to give, there'll be a link in the description. As you can imagine, I put a ton of work into these videos. Of course, as always, pray for Creation Unfolding Ministries, and we'll see you next time. Thank you and goodbye.